Hello, everyone. The brothers of Italy have been placed into power. I believe Sweden also has a far right wing party doing very successfully, and Germany as well. Some of those are mentioned in here, and I'll leave it up to you to decide what's going on in the United States of America. But without any further ado, everybody, friends, and family, here we have by Chris Hedges an article titled The Return of Fascism. As in the 1930s, a bankrupt liberalism, grotesque social inequality, and declining living standards are empowering fascist movements in Europe and the United States. This is The Bankruptcy of the Liberal Ass by Mr. Fish, hiding behind the elephant in its Make America a Great Again regalia, drawing um, exuberantly, joyfully, delightedly, the fascist icons of the past. A fond remembrance. Make it great. Energy and food bills are soaring. Under the onslaught of inflation and prolonged wage stagnation, wages are in free fall. Billions of dollars are diverted by Western nations at a time of economic crisis and staggering income inequality to fund a proxy war in Ukraine. The liberal class, terrified by the rise of neo-fascism and demagogues such as Donald Trump, have thrown in their lot with discredited and reviled establishment politicians who slavishly do the bidding of the war industry, oligarchs, and corporations. The bankruptcy of the liberal class means that those who decry the folly of permanent war and NATO expansion, mercenary trade deals, exploitation of workers by globalization, austerity, and neoliberalism come increasingly from the far right. This right-wing rage dressed up in the United States as Christian fascism has already made huge gains in Hungary, Poland, Sweden, Italy, Bulgaria, and France, and may take power in the Czech Republic, where inflation and rising energy costs have seen the number of Czechs falling below the poverty line double. By next spring, following a punishing winter of rolling blackouts and months when families struggle to pay for food and heat, what is left of our anemic Western democracy could be largely extinguished. Extremism is the political cost of pronounced social inequality and political stagnation. Demagogues who promise moral and economic renewal, vengeance against phantom enemies, and a return to lost glory rise out of the morass. Hatred and violence, already at the boiling point, are legitimized. A reviled ruling class and the supposed civility and democratic norms it espouses are ridiculed. It is not, as the philosopher Gabriel Rockhill points out, as if fascism ever went away. The U.S. did not defeat fascism in World War II, he writes. It discreetly internationalized it. After World War II, the U.S., U.K., and other Western governments collaborated with hundreds of former Nazis and Japanese war criminals who they integrated into Western intelligence services, as well as fascist re regimes such as those in Spain and Portugal. They supported right-wing anti-communist forces in Greece during its civil war in 1946 to 1949, and then backed a right-wing military coup in 1967. NATO also had a secret policy of operating fascist terrorist groups. Operation Gladio, as the BBC detailed in a now-forgotten investigative series, created secret armies, networks of illegal stay-behind soldiers who would remain behind enemy lines if the Soviet Union made a military move into Europe. In actuality, the secret armies carried out assassinations, bombings, massacres, and false flag terror attacks against leftists, trade unionists, and others throughout Europe. See my interview, Chris Hedges' interview, with Stephen Kinzer about the post-war activities of the CIA, including its recruitment of Nazi and Japanese war criminals and its creation of black sites where former Nazis were hired to interrogate, torture, and murder suspected leftist labor leaders and communists, detailed in the Poisoner-in-Chief, Sidney Gottlieb, and CIA search for mind control here. Fascism, which has always been with us, is again ascendant. The far-right politician Giorgia Maloney is expected to become Italy's first female prime minister 
after elections yesterday, Sunday. In a coalition with two other far-right parties, Maloney is forecast to win more than 60% of the seats in Parliament, though the left-leaning five-star movement may put a dent in those expectations. Maloney, I believe, has won. Maloney got her start in politics as a 15-year-old activist for the youth wing of the Italian social movement, founded after the World War II by supporters of Benito Mussolini. She calls EU bureaucrats agents of nihilistic global elites driven by international finance. She peddles the Great Replacement conspiracy that non-white immigrants are being permitted to enter Western nations as part of a plot to undermine or replace the political power and culture of white people. She has called on the Italian Navy to turn back boats with immigrants, which the far-right interior minister Matteo Salvini did in 2018. Her Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, party is a close ally of Hungary's President Viktor Orban. A European Parliament resolution recently declared that Hungary can no longer be defined as a democracy. Maloney and Orban are not alone. Sweden Democrats, which took over 20% of the vote in Sweden's general election last week to become the country's second largest political party, was formed in 1988 from a neo-Nazi group called BSS, or Keep Sweden Swedish. It has deep fascist roots. Of the party's 30 founders, 18 had Nazi affiliations, including several who served in the Waffen-SS. According to Tony Gustafsson, a historian and a former Sweden Democrat member, Frances Marie Le Pen took over 41% of the vote in April against Emmanuel Macron. In Spain, the hard-right Vox Party is the third largest party in Spain's parliament. The far-right German AFD, or Alternative for Germany, party took over 12% in federal elections in 2017, making it the third largest party, though it lost a couple percentage points in the 2021 elections. The U.S. has its own version of fascism, embodied in a Republican Party that coalesces in cult-like fashion around Donald Trump, embraces the magical thinking, misogyny, homophobia, and white supremacy of the Christian right, and actively subverts the election process. Economic collapse was indispensable to the Nazis' rise to power. In the 1928 elections in Germany, the Nazi Party received less than 3% of the vote. Then came the global financial crash of 1929. By early 1932, 40% of the German insured workforce, 6 million people, were unemployed. That same year, the Nazis became the largest political party in the German parliament. parliament. The Weimar government, tone deaf and hostage to the big industrialists, prioritized paying bank loans and austerity rather than feeding and employing a desperate population. It foolishly imposed severe restrictions on who was eligible for unemployment insurance. Millions of Germans went hungry. Desperation and rage rippled through the population. Mass rallies led by a collection of buffoonish Nazis in brown uniforms who would have felt at home at Mar-a-Lago denounced Jews, communists, intellectuals, artists, and the ruling class as internal enemies. Hate was their main currency. It sold well. The evisceration of democratic procedures and institutions, however, preceded the Nazis' ascension to power in 1933. The Reichstag, the German parliament, was as dysfunctional as the U.S. Congress. The socialist leader, Friedrich Ebert, president from 1919 until 1925, and later Heinrich Brüning, chancellor from 1930 to 1932, relied on Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution to largely rule by decree to bypass the fractious parliament. Article 48, which granted the president the right in an emergency to issue decrees, was a trap door through which Germany could fall into dictatorship, historian Benjamin Carter Hett writes. Article 48 was the Weimar equivalent of the executive orders liberally used by Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden to bypass our own legislative impasses. As in the 1930s, Germany, our courts, especially the Supreme Court, have been seized by extremists. The press has bifurcated into antagonistic tribes where lies and truth are indistinguishable, and opposing sides are demonized. There is little dialogue or compromise, the twin pillars of a democratic system. 
The two ruling parties slavishly served the dictates of the war industry, global corporations, and the oligarchy to which it has given huge tax cuts. It has established the most pervasive and intrusive system of government surveillance in human history. It runs the largest prison system in the world. It has, the mili it has militarized the police. Democrats are as culpable as Republicans. The Obama administration interpreted interpreted the 2002 authorization for use of military force as giving the executive branch the right to erase due process and act as judge, jury, and executioner in assassinating U.S. citizens, starting with radical cleric Anwar al awlaki Two weeks later, a U U.S. drone killed Abdul Rahman al awlaki Anwar's 16-year-old son, who was never linked to terrorism, along with nine other teenagers at a cafe in Yemen. It was the Obama administration that signed into law Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act, overturning the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act, which prohibits the use of the military as a domestic police force. It was the Obama administration that bailed out Wall Street and abandoned Wall Street's victims, it was the Obama administration that repeat, repeatedly used the Espionage Act to criminalize those such as Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden, who exposed government lies, crimes and fraud, and it was the Obama administration that massively expanded the use of militarized drones. The Nazis responded to the February 1933 burning of the Reichstag, which they likely staged by employing Article 48 to push through the decree for the protection of the people in the state. The fascists instantly snuffed out the pretense of Weimar democracy. They legalized imprisonment without trial for anyone considered a national security threat. They abolished independent labor unions, freedom of speech, freedom of association, and freedom of the press, along with the privacy of postal and telephone communications. The step from dysfunctional democracy to full-blown fascism was, and will again be, a small one. The hatred for the ruling class, embodied by the establishment Republican and Democratic parties, which have merged into one ruling party, is nearly universal. The public battling inflation that is at a 40-year high and cost the average U.S. household an additional $717 a month in July alone, will increasingly see any political figure or political party willing to attack the traditional ruling elites as an ally. The more crude, irrational, or vulgar the attack, the more the disenfranchised rejoice. These sentiments are true here and in Europe, where energy costs are expected to rise by as much as 80% this winter, and an inflation rate of 10% is eating away at incomes. The reconfiguration of society under neoliberalism to exclusively benefit the billionaire class, the slashing and privatization of public services, including schools, hospitals, and utilities, along with deindustrialization, the profligate pouring of state funds and resources into the war industry at the expense of the nation's infrastructure and social services, and the building of the world's largest prison system and militarization of police have predictable results. At the heart of the problem is a loss of faith in traditional forms of government and democratic solutions. Fascism in the 1930s succeeded, as Peter Drucker observed, not because people believed its conspiracy theories and lies, but in spite of the fact that they saw through them. Fascism thrived in the face of a hostile press, a hostile radio, a hostile cinema, a hostile church, and a hostile government which untiringly untiringly pointed out the Nazi lies, the Nazi inconsistency, the unattainability of their promises, and the dangers and folly of their course. He added, nobody would have been a Nazi if rational belief in the Nazi promises had been a prerequisite. As in the past, these new fascist parties cater to emotional yearnings. They give vent to feelings of abandonment, worthlessness, despair, and alienation. They promise unattainable miracles. They, too, peddle bizarre conspiracy theories, including QAnon, but most of all, they promise vengeance against a ruling class that betrayed the nation. Pet defines the Nazis as a nationalist protest movement against globalization. The rise of the new fascism has its roots in a similar exploitation by global corporations and oligarchs. More than anything else, people want to regain control over their lives, 
if only to punish those blamed and scapegoated for their misery. We have seen this movie before.